Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. The New York Times describes William Thompson as New York City's upwardly mobile controller. They also describe him as a suave, svelte mayoral hopeful in 2009. He still doesn't drink Snapple, and you won't find him enjoying himself at the proposed Randall's Island theme park. Suave, svelte, upwardly mobile. Is that you, Controller Thompson? Uh, I didn't quite recognize who they were talking about, and I guess I have to lose a bit more weight to be this far. Uh, well, to be svelte, definitely. Okay, now you're not doing bad. <laughs> Let's talk about two of your favorite subjects. Well, one of your favorite subjects, mm -hmm. Snapple. We had you on the show. You, you know, excoriated it. Then you came back, did it again. Mm -hmm. You've been vindicated. What's what was the what was the problem with the particular deal? And does it represent some sort of systemic blindness on the part of the Bloomberg administration? Well, I, I think it was you know in in this case it was them. I think the Bloomberg administration wanted to get to a certain point. They wanted to have a deal done with Snapple. Uh, so it's one of the few times that in a, what's supposed to be a public process, you don't do a written RFP. I've never heard of that before in a contract of that size. Uh, and in the end, there were almost no rules that went into the selection, particularly on the Department of Education mm -hmm. contract with Snapple. There were almost no rules that you went into. It was a question of openness, transparency, and fairness. And that's why I opposed the contract there. When it went to a larger citywide piece, I opposed it. I voted against it at the uh, Franchise Review Committee and continue to say, in the end, you know, it is, it, that's a contract that should have been voided, reopened, and let's get the best bid for the city of New York. Un you know, unfortunately, and this is one of those you'd almost like to have been wrong because the city would have gotten more money. Instead, what we've seen y years later is a downsized, you know, uh, contract. It didn't from 126 to 33 million. Exactly, it didn't live up to the promise that it was, you know, that Just everyone talked hype. about. It was, I think, poorly done. And when you start, okay. when you start with the answer and work your way backwards, because I think they started with, we want to do Snapple, and then they worked their way okay. into it. It should have been done in an open process. It would have been better for the city. It would have provided more money for us. Now, you just tangled recently with the City Marketing Development Corp over distribution of profits. Well, it, it's a question of you're, the money's supposed to flow back into the city. Instead, mm -hmm. it appeared to flow or stay with them. So the, the questions about where does the money go, the process on that, making sure that the marketing corporation is there to drive money for the city of New York, to go into the general fund, to go for things like education and hospitals and others. The question was, where's the money, okay. and then why isn't it flowing back? Why is it staying with that corporation over and above what it takes to run it? Right. So those are some of the hard questions okay. we asked. Talk about the uh, marketing corporation. Is it is it is it the right idea? Is it just done done poorly, mm -hmm. or is it doing well except for an occasional screw up or two? No, I think you know, I, I think it is in its infant state, or still, it, it's not quite. An infant, but it's growing a little bit. Uh, I think if you you know you looked, it was started a few years ago. I, the Snapple deal was probably the first uh, deal, and I think they're starting to learn from their mistakes over a period of time. I'm not against marketing New York City. I think it's a good idea mm. and trying new and creative things and trying to bring additional revenue to the city. And I give the Bloomberg administration credit for trying new things. It's a question of when you start with something and you have no rules. Uh, and you try and make them up as you go along, I think that's where it creates the problems. But what's the story with Randall's Island? You're opposing the Randall Island deal for the very same reasons that you opposed the Snapple deal, and it's three years later? I mean, what's the learning curve? Here? Yeah, as I said, I think, you know, in, in some instances, if you look right now, they're, they're out marketing for the, you know, the, the delivery agent, whether it's a DHL or a, a FedEx, they put, they put that RFP out. It's being done in an open fashion. Right. Uh, but so I they think, are learning I think with this have. express carrier Absolute, bid. Absolutely. It's being done in an open fashion. It's the way it's supposed to be done. Yeah, and, and you, you've made the distinction between, uh, I think you called it private sector expediency versus 
public sector transparency. And is that one of the dangers, sort of the businessman mayor approach to city government? Well, the thing that, that you don't have to do in the private sector, you don't have to turn around and justify a lot of the things that you mm -hmm. do. In the public right. sector, you okay. do. And also, it, it's decisions that get made today or a process that you use today, you want to be able to use tomorrow sure. and the day after. You have to be able in government to turn around and look at the public and say, we did it openly, we did it fairly, and the public can believe that the best thing was done for the public, for the people of right. the city. I, and that's, and yeah. that's why, you know, in some process or in some instances, I'm very vocal about it because you've got to be able to ensure integrity in government. That's important. Okay. Let's talk about city finances and city mm -hmm. budget. Can the good times continue to roll? I mean, the city literally has gotten this unanticipated tax windfall, an economic right. boom. What's driving it and what are the impediments ahead? So much of what has been driving our recent budget surpluses. Now we've has had been multi billion dollar budget surpluses in, in the last two years? In last year in excess of three billion dollars, this year in excess of four billion dollars. So seven billion over the last two it, three it, years. Times have been good. Closer to really more than eight billion dollars. Wow. Uh, so much of what has fueled it? Real estate. And the real estate market and the sales and people refinancing and a number of things, that has been helpful. Mm -hmm. You're seeing interest rates start to go up, a little bit of a slowing in the high end of the real estate market. So we think, you know, I don't think that the economy, even though other things are doing well, Wall Street's doing well, tourism is up. If you look across sectors, so it's across it sectors. Is. If you and, look across and is sectors, is it synergistic? Is it interactive with each other? Does it feed on itself? Some yes, some no. I, okay. I just think that you know, it, it, you're looking at all sectors across the okay. city are doing better. And that's important. At the same point, how long can you sustain it? Right. The truth is, and, and, and I mean, it's funny, I did a speech a few years ago, and the person who helped to write the speech opened up with a story, it was a child story, and talked about, you know, a bear squirreling food away for the winter, and one of the bears just, you know, continued to enjoy themselves and didn't do anything, didn't squir put food away. Well, in the end, the winter comes, you know, sooner or later, but it always comes. The same thing in the economy is going to slow. Mm -hmm. It will start to go away from us. It's only a question of when, two years, three years, four years. Things will slow down a little bit, and then we won't have the same record surpluses. So the only question is when. I think we all agree with that. Okay, but the mayor has seemed to play the responsible bear here. He's putting aside money. Comment on the mayor's fiscal prudence here, if you will, putting the money into, I guess it's health care and future pension right. costs. I've, I've given the mayor, and this is over a period of years now, high marks on budget. I think that there's been a real focus in not eroding and cutting city services during the really tough times, making sure we were able to rebound quicker. Mm -hmm. Right now, as we're looking at record surpluses, what the mayor has done in this fiscal year is to put a billion dollars on the side, and next year we're putting a billion dollars on the side to hold against future health care costs. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a change in accounting. It says that you have to start to reflect those, you know, those liabilities down the road. We're doing that, but also the mayor's starting to put money on the side against that. Can it be used if the economy goes away from us and be able to act as a hedge? Possibly. Okay. And I think that makes sense. So I've given, I think it is, you know, I've advocated for the last couple of years a rainy day fund. I thought it made sense to the city of New York. This may not be an exact rainy day fund, mm -hmm. but in the end, it can look like one. So I think it is creative on the part of the mayor. I think it looks down the road and says, you know something, times are going to change. Let's put some money aside. So I think he's done an excellent job. It is established, it is set a precedent uh, moving forward. And when we have good budgets or good budget years, let's put some money away. Let me, let me digress for a moment. I have to follow up. What's wrong with New York State? What's wrong with Albany? They're almost like the anti what you should be doing with budgeting. New York City and New York State, comparisons first. And, and, and New York City is probably, when you look at our finances, the best, not big city, but one of the best municipalities in the country as far as openness, transparency, as far as being able to understand people monitor our budget, my office and a number of others, just being able to sound, you know, here's a problem, let's, let, let's be prepared. New York State at the same point, and but then again, what created New York City, that structure, was almost going bankrupt in the mid-70s. Right. The state didn't. And what's happened is the state doesn't have to have balanced budgets. They run deficits. They borrow money and use borrowed money to pay And they have the bills. authorities borrowing um, tens of billions. In, in New York State needs a real overhaul and, and needs to, I mean, when you look at New York State's ratings and all this, and we're one of the worst in the country. 
needs to be done differently. Do, do you see any hope of that, no matter what happens in the next legislative and gubernatorial election? Is it going to change at all, or is the I game think, going to be the same? I think possibly. I think the public's concern, and the public has expressed concern over the last couple of years about structures that don't work, about processes that don't work in Albany. I think with a new governor coming in, uh, you know, and, and hopefully that'll be Elliot Spitzer, but a new governor coming in, I think that there's a real hope for different processes and more openness, more transparency, and let's start to live within our means. I think that's incredibly important. That seems to be the, the mantra of all four of the major party candidates, mm -hmm. the two Democrats and the two Republicans, is this Albany dysfunction, but it, it sucks people in. I'm not, I'm not as sanguine as you are that this is remediable, but we'll talk about that. I, I, think, that the public, I think the public's concern, and the, both the press and public have expressed concern in the last couple of years, and you started to see some change. Right. I think you'll see a lot more change. Okay, let's go back to the pension and health care. Mm -hmm. The mayor is saving for future expenses, but we still have the structural problem of health care costs and pensions. You're paying for it, but you're not, you're not shifting the burden, changing the number of tiers in the pension system. It's still systemically the same thing. No, I know, but you know, I, I think if you look at pension costs particularly, and late part of the 90s, New York City almost didn't have to contribute into its pension. The market was doing so well, and we're above the, our assumption rate, which is 8%. As a matter of fact, if you looked at it, was it 99? There was so much money in the pension funds, they did a restart, a technical right. restart, and pulled money out. So, so I, pensions aren't one of these uncontrollable costs that are really driving the, the budget pensions, problems? Pensions are cyclical also. Market goes up, less, you know, less that the city has to pay in pension costs. So I think if you look at a number of different things, it is not just, you know, it's not just pension costs in the long term. They go up and down. And, I, and you know, I think if you see some who are talking about, let's go to a defined benefit or a defined, you know, contribution plan as opposed to a defined benefit plan, I think it's a mistake. Why? Next, that was my next no, question. No, I think if you work for the city of New York, if you work for government, in the end, you are making less today than, you, you know, than you'd make in the private sector. Go do the comparisons. Almost always it stands, up, it stands out to be true. Okay. That's in, in the end. So you're working a lifetime making less than you would make in the private sector working for the government, working for the public sector. In the end, the trade-off is you'll have a retirement. You'll have a pension in the end. You'll have health benefits. I think that's a fair trade-off. Okay. So I, ha I don't have a problem with what that. What about health care costs? Well, health care costs, you know, we can talk and look at the local and say, look at New York City, look at the state, look at these individual instances. But what it brings back again is the need for on a national level, okay. both for the national government, for the federal government, as well as for the state, to take greater control over health care, to start talking about national health care. And that's, it's a shame that we don't have that. Uh, but eventually, if you look at what continues, the escalating costs, the problems that we have across the nation, not just in New York, the federal government needs to step up on okay. this one. The federal government doesn't step in. What do the state and localities do? What is the what is the mayor of the city of New York? The state doing? is already starting. If you look, and I mean, the, the mayor has less control. The state has more control. If you look, the state is looking at hospitals, looking at costs and expenditures there. It's capping Medicaid in a number of different ways. I think there's a real concern okay. about that. So the state is making is where the city can't in so many ways because we don't have control. Right. The state is. Okay. You control the five major New York City pension funds. Well, I'm the chief investor. No, you're, I'm sorry. That's, that's, you explain it rather than right. me. New York City has five pension funds. I'm a, I'm a trustee on four of the five, chief investment officer for all five. But at the same point, if you look at five of them, there are probably more than 40 trustees on the five boards. Okay. Uh, I all, take it back. So there again, my, 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 my colleagues on the boards would be concerned at how it was expressed. Okay. How much money is, are in these funds? And have have we have we benefited from this boom in Wall Street in terms of the pension, you know, the the amount in, in, in the funds? I think that we have. I think if you look, we have our pension funds right now are probably right about a hundred billion dollars on the five pension funds. Uh, I think we've benefited in a number of different ways from Wall Street's improvement. If you look, we were probably at about $72 billion just a few years ago. Now we're back at $100 billion. Okay. So, I mean, you know, back in the ebbs and flow, the one thing that we are trying to do, uh, and as the chief investment officer, is to spread that risk out. So the next time Wall Street drops, you know, over an extended period of time, as it did, you know, around 2000, 2001, is to make sure that we have more hedges, real estate, private equity, other things. So we have things to balance it so we're more diversified than we were before. Okay. 
One last budget finance question. Sure. What do the out years look like, and is it difficult to determine given the really unexpected and constantly unexpected budget surpluses that we've had. What does it look like now? We are looking at budget, we are looking at out year budget gaps of anywhere from I think $3 billion up to you know, somewhere between 3 and $4 billion. So we are looking at out year budget gaps. If we don't have a good year, a good budget, a good economy, and don't have money to roll over, we're going to run into a problem. So, but haven't you said this the last two years too? And everybody, and the thing about it is, you always urge caution and to right, be honest. Okay. If I, you look, the mayor is expressing the same thing. Right. Let's not start to spend into this surplus. Let's put money on the side. Okay. What do you make of the Christine Quinn, Mike Bloomberg mm -hmm. budget choreography? Is it the same dance with different performers, or the dance steps in the routine changing a little bit, but significantly? Oh, I think it's a different dance uh, these days. Okay. I think if you look, there's probably Probably more cooperation. Uh, I think Chris, at the same point, while representing the city council, has even said to her members, "Let's do things differently. Right. Let's, you know, this is not. Let's not go." I think she's expressed to the mayor, "Let's not go through the dance of making cuts, the council adding things back. Let's leave things in place so that dance doesn't exist, and let's focus on, you know, doing things." not just in a pork barrel fashion, but let's have members of the city council start to look at larger issues and, and come together. Then a number of people have to sign on to be able to add things to the that budget. That was clearly a rationalization of that process. That was a crazy process. No, but I think it is. as uh, In bringing some sense to it and bringing focus to it, uh, I just think it's, you know, I think Speaker Quinn is doing an excellent job on it. Okay. That. Let's look at current, recent, and future audits and initiatives. Just going through the audits from, you know, Harlem Hospital Reviews, Department of Buildings, money left unguarded, P poor conditions. I mean, you, you've gone after the mass rail folks, mm -hmm. the LARR, and the Metro North Station situation. I mean, I, I would have never known any of this. Right. is appalling. Your purview is extraordinarily extensive. I mean, what is it that you can't look at? Well, the, the one thing that I've, you know, in, in one form or another, what I've said to the people in my office when they say, what can we do and what we can't do, I've said we can do anything. So, you know, when you go back and you look at the Transit Authority back a few years ago, the audit that we did of the Transit Authority. Right. We talked about that. Exactly. You did that here. When had that been done before? The answer was never. And at that point, being able to reach out to you know my friend Alan Hevesy, who just became state controller, right. say, I can look at the transit authority piece, look at the MTA piece, and then we compare notes after the fact. That's you know. So the idea is, in the end, what can you look at? Almost anything that you want. And you two have worked together subsequently in terms of sharing information. You oh, know, absolutely. If you, state if you control. look just in the last couple of days, the state controller has looked at and looked around the state at the reporting of, you know, incidents within schools. Right. Uh, right. And looked at underreporting. And he, you know, we've had a conversation before where he was looking at the state at the state, but not at New York City. Right. He was coming out with a report and said, "Hey, you know, this is what I'm going to do, and we're taking a look at New York City and the reporting of statistics here." Okay, looking at a couple of the audits that I want to sort of focus mm -hmm. on, the cash program. Talk about the program, talk about the problem. Well, it's, it's not, as you said, that's not one of the audits, but what we had proposed. I'm sorry. Uh, ca the cash program, it's, uh, you know, basically a program for senior citizens to be able to look at pattern after the mayor's rebate. Seniors on fixed incomes who are homeowners are being killed. Costs are going up. They're on fixed incomes. So in looking at that and figuring out and hearing it from seniors across the city who were concerned that they might lose their homes, uh, we pattern a program, you know, action for senior citizens, for senior homeowners, um, city action for, you know, senior, senior homeowners. And what it can do is, in the end, and we're working with the city council now and the state legislature to try and pass legislation, provide a rebate of up to $600 for senior homeowners. Coupled with the mayor's rebate, which would provide $400, you're looking at the possibility of providing $1,000 in rebates for senior homeowners. So you're proposing policy and program as well as studying and analyzing it. Is that sort of the traditional role of the controller? Well, as I said, I think in the last few years, uh, since I've been controller, we haven't just you know followed the traditional path. It has been an aggressive controller's office, and it is not just in reacting. It is proposing and initiating things. So this to stand up, hearing you know the concern of seniors from across the city, and then coming up with a solution, at least for senior homeowners, and saying this is something can be done to help provide some relief for them. Okay. Also, let's let's move on. The Department mm -hmm. of Health and Me Mental Health, the HIV/AIDS program. Mm -hmm. You were critical of that. Yes, and looking at, as they've done new contracts under the Ryan White Act, uh, you know they've contracted with an outside nonprofit 
to provide in this case, this is about the first contract that we looked at was about was close to five hundred million dollars with this contract. And what they've done is to shrink the number of subcontractors in this uh, and reduce services to, or at least consolidate services in some places. But I, we, we're looking at a reduction of services in an unfair and unequitable way to Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. So there's geographic discrimination. Absolutely. So it is, you know, it, is, it, it was looking at that. In that case, we're just registering that contract. We have to do that legally, but it was in looking at the contract, analyzing it, and talking about the disparities in different communities across the city and different boroughs and the unfairness of it. So, no, it's, uh, that's what we tried to do there. What are you doing about the oil prices, the gas prices, anything? Can the controller do anything? Can the mayor do anything? Is there anything that can be done locally about the price of gasoline in the city? Uh, probably not as far as changing and working on the price of that. It's, you know, the only tax that you wind up seeing is mostly on the state level okay. or on the federal level. What we've tried to do is, because as the chief investment officer for the pension funds, we've written all the oil companies. You know, to look, and particularly the independent directors under the change of law, mm -hmm. independent directors comprise the audit committee. We've asked, as well as a majority of the, nom of the compensation committees, we've asked them to take a look at two things. First, is there price gouging going on? Take a look at their own houses, mm -hmm. do an investigation, and then come back and let us know, are some of their people engaged in price gouging to try and drive the price down again? So we've tried to do that, as well as some of the exorbitant amounts being paid the executives in these companies. I forget, was it Exxon Mobil? Gentleman, I mean, the former CEO left with hundreds of millions of dollars. Question becomes, wait a minute, are they benefiting from the increase of price of, oil, of gasoline? So wait a minute, let's take a look, the, not, the compensation committees, let's look at how their executives are compensated and let's not, and make sure that we, it's reined in a little bit and that they're not benefiting from the rise of oil, of oil and gas prices. Okay. So we've pushed in a couple of different ways. Now, as, as, the, head, you know, as the investment advisor and mm -hmm. trustee on these uh, pension funds, you, the controls office, in a sense, conducts a foreign policy. Uh, just recently, two things. One in Indonesia, where you have the Freeport McRowan Copper and Gold Company. Mm -hmm. You're after them for paying bribes to Indonesian officials. Mm -hmm. And in Iran, you have AON. AON, right. AON, well. Uh, withdrawing their uh, insurance business on the threat of a proxy fight by one William C. Thompson. It is, and, and I would say on, on behalf of the trustees right, of our no, boards, of course. But, at, but at the same point, it is a question of not conducting foreign policy in things that are done, not just here in the United States, but around the world, that endanger our prices, the stock prices. Prices go down, it costs the, the members of our pension fund, and it looks at, and you look at the risks that companies incur around not just the country, but around the world, and how it may affect them, both directly and indirectly. Does it have reputational risk? Is there direct risk for the companies? So what we've done in different, in different places, no, Freeport MacMoran in, Indo in Indonesia, it appears as if, in a huge New York Times article, it appears as if we'd had human rights concerns before. There were concerns about people being killed. Mm -hmm. okay. Now it, all, it appears as if they were paying you know, government officials or military leaders, uh, paying them under the table. We, th that's a crime. We need that to investigate. I wrote the SEC as well as the Justice Department to ask them to take a look at it. But you look at companies doing business in nations that support terrorism, Iran, Syria, and nations like that, going back to, no, Forster, Wheeler, and Aon, but other companies mm -hmm. like Halliburton, GE, and ConocoPhillips. We've written them over the last few years and in the end got them to stop utilizing these little loopholes in the law because in the end we believe it poses risk to our pension funds and getting them to stop it. In the end, we do, I do have fiduciary responsibility responsibility, but, you know, those who will say it's public, po it's foreign policy, no, it's good business sense. That's exactly what it is. But it sounds like an exciting place, the controller's office. You're having a good time. I'm having a great time, yes. And your staff has a good time. Where do these, how does this bubble up? How do you, your office, generate the audits and studies that they, I mean, what is the, how does it bubble up? Some is, some in recommendations. I mean, as you look at audits, some of it is posed at the moment. If, mm -hmm. if you look, the Transit Authority audit, it was clear as they were doing, not the last one, but the negotiation before that with the Transport Workers Union, that their deficit numbers changed 
three times yeah, in well, 10 I mean, days. That, even it's, I can figure that so out. So it's kind of like, let's come back and do an audit right, on this one. There's right. something wrong here. But another one's... Like, do the Indonesian one. How did that, that... Do you remember how that happened? Some people would reach out to our office, so okay. you look at different instances. I mean, different uh, other public pension funds, members of staff, the public. People okay. look at... It's the same thing in looking at different agencies and audits there. You get recommendations. We'd lay out a larger audit plan. Uh, you know, or or situations presented, oil prices, gas prices. Wait a minute, let's take a look at that. Let's write, you know, let's write to the independent okay. uh, members so of the board. So you get it from everywhere and you do Absolutely. everything. Absolutely, it's you try not to limit a yourself. Apply, apply at the controller's office. <laughs> let's go to politics. I quoted the Times in the opening of the show and mm -hmm. called you upwardly mobile. Now they're not referring to your socioeconomic status. Oh, I'd hope so. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> right. Forget it. But you could. I mean, you're, I mean, yeah, you could probably make a hell of a lot more in the private sector. Where do you move up to the controller? May of 2009. Talk about the mayor's race. Well, it's, I mean, as I said, it, it's w without declaring. No, I understand. But, you, but, but, no, but, but you, you've expressed an interest. Absolutely. And it's an obvious next I've, step. I've said I'd like to be mayor one day. Um, but it's got to be 2009. You don't want to well, wait till 2013. You'll be, be a lot old, older. As old as I am. <laughs> Look, it, it is something clearly that I'm considering. I think you're working in a direction. But the one thing about it, and as I said, I, 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 if, I, if I said I wasn't interested, I'd be lying. At the same point, the one thing is, you know, I've been, I've been re-elected as controller. I've, I've been in office now for five months. I have a four-year term. Sure. If you ignore the job that you ah. have now uh, and just look to the future, guess what? You don't do this job well, there is no future. Yeah, and so, if you do it well, there is a future yes. because, in fact, as we've just discussed, your fingers are in loads of pies. You've got, the, mm -hmm. you know, the purview is the city. What better place to come from than the controller's office? Well, it's, 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 we'll, we'll see in the long run. But at the same point, it has been, you know, it's been a pleasure and a privilege to work for the people of the city of New York. Would I like to continue doing that in the future? Yes, I would. The politics of the race, it looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, we're, we're, we're talking about 2009. See, that's the, it's, it's totally insane. It's the, I don't know if the we thing should that's do amazing, this. And I, can say crazy. That, and I can say that to you because you understand. It's, it's crazy. 2006. And we it's haven't had the amazing. Senate race. We exactly. haven't had the governor's race. We've Forget got, it. I don't want to talk to you about got, politics. We've you got know, a race this year for governor and, and statewide offices. You've got a race in 2008. Well, Senate race is, You've got a race in 2008 for president. Right. All of this right. before. Forget it. I don't want to talk about 2009. Forget okay. it. We, we're, we're never going to talk about mayoral politics with you again. That's it. You're invited back, but no mayoral politics. Uh, 2008 or 9. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Continue, Doug.